today is Pentecost, and it started last night at sundown, okay. and it goes until tonight at sundown. Um, and so, uh, a lot of this teaching is 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 going to be, as I said, based on slides, and I invite your participation. So. <laughs> You know, before we get into Pentecost, which as you see in the slide there is is, is the middle feast. And uh, before we, we, we get into depth on that subject, I want to kind of give an overview of the feast days of the Lord. Because until you understand a lot of the basics, uh, the, the, it, it's like a big picture. You gotta you gotta see the forest first, and then you and then you and then you go into the for us and see the, the details and they just make a lot more sense. So the biblical feast days, actually the word there, biblical holiday holidays, that comes from holy days. Holy days, the word comes from holy days. Uh, and you can see they're organized into spring holidays and fall holidays. So the spring feasts and the fall feasts. And, you know, in this particular Picture Pentecost is part of the spring holidays, but I prefer to think of Pentecost as a separate, not in the spring. It's really in in the summer, the beginning of the summer, or, or maybe late spring. But you can see the spring holidays, the first three there, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits that represent those all happened in in eight, you know, in one week, and so. Uh, <clears throat> The first three feasts were fulfilled during Jesus' first coming. After Jesus left and went to heaven, he sent down the Holy Spirit. And that's uh, for the church age. You can see the, the, the timeline there underneath, the church age. The Holy Spirit came for the church age to empower us. And then the last three fall holidays... I'm sorry, uh, Mike, just to clarify. It's Israel, like Northern Hemisphere... When you say that's fall, right. For us, it won't be the fall. That's right. Uh, the fall holidays uh, take place are going to be fulfilled during the second coming of Jesus Christ. So another way you can think of it is, you know, the first the first four have already been fulfilled. The last three have yet to be fulfilled, and they will be fulfilled. Can you go to the next slide? Please? Here's another picture of the same idea. Uh, you know, the first three. Shekinah. Yeah, that's right, the Shekinah way. Yeah. <laughs> Pentecost is in the middle, and on the left is the first coming of Jesus Christ, on the right is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Next, please. Okay, so in Leviticus 23, when the feasts are introduced, um, you know, I'm just going to read this. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Okay, so the first thing is, God called them the feasts of the Lord. He didn't call them the feasts of Israel. And, and, and it's a very important distinction. He called them his feasts. So these holy days belong to God. They don't belong to the Jews or to Israel. These are God's feasts. This is possessive. You know, the feasts of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and this represents that salvation is for everyone. You know, it's not just for the Jews. These are the feasts of the Lord, you know, and, and praise God that we're included in, in this prophecy. We're a part of this prophecy. The prophecy is directed towards us. Now, the word feast... You know, when we think of the word feast, we think of, you know, sitting down and eating a bunch of food. But that's really the wrong picture. <laughs> the word feast is moad uh, in Hebrew. And the, defini the definition means appointed time or appointed place or appointed season, appointed signal. And... Uh, you know, so, you know, the dictionary says it's an appointment, a fixed time or a season, a sign or a signal as appointed beforehand. So each of these feast days, think of it as, as God's, God's made an appointment for the future. And they're in his appointment book. They're in his calendar. I, that's the way I like to think of it, is the feast days are God's calendar. And they're important dates. And as we'll see later... Jesus fulfilled, go back Luke please, Jesus fulfilled these uh, feast days 
during his first coming in minute detail. I mean, it's amazing when you go through and see how uh, how much detail is in this and how you're filled. And a lot of it isn't even the Word of God. It's Jewish tradition. Yeah, yeah. You know? It, 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 it's been fulfilled. The Hebrew word for convocation, he says, you shall proclaim to be holy convocations the Feast of the Lord. I want you to proclaim them. Convocation is mikra, which means called to a public assembly, and it also has a connotation of rehearsing something. So what God is saying, these are rehearsal dates. These are dates where I want you to rehearse what I've told you to do. So the idea is the main event is coming. It's a, pro it's a prophecy of an event that's coming, and you, what you're doing is you're rehearsing. You know, and so there's a purpose for a rehearsal because when the main event comes, if you haven't been rehearsing, you're not going to recognize what ha what just happened. You know, <laughs> and this has a lot of of connotations for the last three feasts, which have yet to be fulfilled. Mm. Studying these feasts, you're gonna you're gonna understand what the main event is going to be because you're rehearsing it. Mm. Now we're not going to get into the last three feasts today. We're going to talk mostly about Pentecost, but Okay, so I kind of came up with my own translation of Leviticus 1, 23, 1 and 2, you know, and I'm, I'm not, you know, adding to or subtracting to the Word of God, at least I hope I'm not here. <laughs> but I put, okay, so the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy public dress rehearsals, these are my appointments on my calendar. Okay, can you go to the next slide, Luke? So, the, the Feast of the Lord are prophetic, as we mentioned, and, and here's some scriptures that talk about exactly this. They're a shadow of things to come. And when you think of a shadow, a shadow is cast by the true object, right? Mm -hmm. So, when, you, when you're looking at the shadow, you don't see, you know, you don't see the person, but you're seeing a shadow, which is is kind of it's kind of looking through a mirror, you know, dimly. Yeah. Colossians two sixteen through seventeen says, "So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. All of, all of that terminology. When the Jews read that, they'd be thinking these are the feast days that he's talking about. And so he says, these feast days are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ." That's because Jesus Christ is going to, is fulfilling all of the feasts. Yeah. The appointments are, you know, Jesus is, is the one, is the star of the play that we're rehearsing. Yeah. And he's going to fulfill yeah. them all. And they're prophetic on many different levels. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17 through 18, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Amen. For surely I say to you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So that speaks to the minute detail in the feast days that will be fulfilled. Can you go to the next slide, Luke? Okay, so we're, we're looking at, at God's calendar now. And just to kind of describe this slide, you've got the months of the Jewish year in the outer part of the circle, starting with Nisan, which is month number one, and going all the way around to Adar, which is month number 12 on the Jewish calendar. And on, on, the, on the darker circle, on the interior, you can see our months. And so you see how they don't line up perfectly. You know, our month is, starts in January. Uh, the Jewish month starts in Nisan in, in, uh, in, March, in the March and April time frame. There are differences in our calendar that, uh, you know, result in every year. It, 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 there's no direct lineup. You know, in other words, Passover on the Jewish calendar does not land on our calendar on the same day every time. Yeah. And that's primarily because the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar based on the moon. Each month is uh, starts when the new moon, when you see that the moon is dark and you see a sliver of the moon. Mm -hmm. That's when the Jewish month starts. 
So you can look up into the sky. When you look up into the sky and see the, the sliver of the new moon, you can know for with certainty that, okay, a, a Jewish month just started. <laughs> and the, another, another thing is that on the 15th of the Jewish month, the moon is always full without fail. So when you look up in the sky and you see a full moon, you know it's the middle of, the, of a Jewish month. So in, in Nisan, the first month, you can see at the top there the three feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. Jesus fulfilled those during Holy Week when he died on the cross, when his, body, his sinless body was buried, Unleavened Bread. And then when he was raised from the dead on first fruits, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. Mm-hmm. And then you see in the middle during May and June, Pentecost takes place. It's actually 50 days after the feast of first fruits. Mm-hmm. Pentecost is always 50 days. It's seven weeks in one day. And uh, and then down at the bottom during the seventh month in Tishri, you've got the feast of trumpets. The uh, Day of Atonement in between, and then Tabernacles at the end. That all takes place within a 15-day period. Tabernacles is on the 15th day of the month. Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of the month. Mm -hmm. And and so you see how the the spring feasts are all grouped together. The fall feasts are all grouped together. And then Pentecost is in the middle. That represents the church age. And so a couple things I want you to notice. The only feast day that starts on the first day of the month is trumpets. Mm -hmm. And when you read in the Bible about the Feast of Trumpets, it always talks about darkness because the moon's dark. Mm -hmm. So, you know, understanding this like unlocks a lot of things. You know, when the Jews hear, hear, read the New Testament, you know, they're, they're going back to the Old Testament because they understand all these things. And it's like, oh, okay, he's talking about the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, Tabernacles, as I said, is on the 15th. It's always on a full moon. And that's one of the feasts where they would dwell in, um, in like tents. Mm-hmm. And the top of the roof, you can see the little picture there was covered with leaves, palm trees. Mm-hmm. And you could actually see through those, you know, the, the whole point was you could see the full moon overhead, you know, when you were hanging out in your tabernacle. And, and that represents Jesus when he returns. He's going to tabernacle among us. Um, okay, so uh, unleavened bread in the spring feast is on the 15th also. There's a full moon on unleavened bread. Okay, next, next slide, please. Okay, this is this is another picture. I'm sorry, it's a it's a little bit small. This one is the, the inner circle again is our months. Can you see January through December lined up? Yes. And the Jewish calendar uh, is set up accordingly. But th- this kind of gives you a picture of how God's calendar is is based on the agricultural cycle and the harvest. Okay, so uh, you can see uh, in in the months. In the eighth month, see where it says first rains? It might be hard for you to see. Uh, here, give me the, can you give me the, yeah. Uh, r- right around here, right here, see that? First rains, and then they plant the grain. This is winter. This is, it's the wet season. The grain is planted, and the spring feasts are all down here. And here, here you got the latter rains right before the harvest starts. The flax harvest is here. The barley harvest is here. Mm -hmm. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we'll read later that one of the requirements is that you bring the first fruits of the barley harvest into the temple and present them to the Lord. Okay? During Pentecost, this is during the wheat harvest. And we'll see that during Pentecost, you bring in the first fruits of of the wheat harvest and present them to the Lord. During Pentecost. And uh, we'll get into this later, but one of the things about the, the wheat harvest is that you're supposed to put leaven and bake bread with your wheat, with the first free fruits of your wheat. And so Pentecost represents the resurrection of, of sinners and the sanctification of sinners. Whereas Passover, this is all about Jesus. There's no leaven in the, in the offering that, that you're supposed to bring during during this week. 
because Jesus was unleavened. And then, and then here, you know, you tend the vine, you know, during the dry season, and the, the fruits start to ripen. Here you got the grape harvest, and um, there's olive harvest and, and a fig harvest, you know, so the fruits ripen in the fall. And look, this is the, you know, this is all about Jesus' return and the judgment. And you remember in Revelation, you got the grapes, which represent, you know, God's judgment on, on those who aren't saved. Okay, so on, on the Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, a lot of times in the Bible they'll, they'll talk about three feasts, or, or you know, it talks about how you're required to go go to Jerusalem three times a year, and, and a lot of times they'll say there's three feasts. Well, really, that's because Passover has three feasts, but you you all you go to Jerusalem for all three of those at once, right? And then for Pentecost, you go to Jerusalem. And then for the fall, the three fall feasts, you go to Jerusalem. And so those three feasts represent the three stages of uh, of uh, our redemption, which starts with salvation. Those are the spring feasts. Justification is is part of salvation. We're, we're justified and redeemed before the Lord. Go back, please. And um, sanctification it, it, Pentecost in the church age represents our sanctification where the Holy Spirit comes within us and if we walk in the Spirit we put the death of the deeds of the flesh so we're, we're getting sanctified and then our glorification when Jesus comes and returns we're going to be glorified okay go ahead um, we already kind of covered this the barley ripens the time of Passover the wheat ripens around Pentecost and the grapes ripen. These three crops represent three classes of people. The barley represents the overcomers. The wheat represents the believers, the rest of the believers. And the grapes represent the unbelievers. And uh, this is something else that's probably opening up in your mind. Like, oh, okay, the barley. <laughs> and it's amazing how, uh, you know, you'll start to pay attention to Jesus' parables, and some of them talk about barley, and some of them talk about wheat. Barley, I'm a barley! <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, um, barley, let me just read this, is, is barley, as compared to wheat, barley is a hardy plant that can withstand drought and extreme heat and cold, as compared to wheat. When the scriptures talk of grain or meal, in a time of drought, it's almost always going to be referring to barley. Because if there's a drought, wheat's not going to be around. Barley is the only grain that can withstand drought. And so it's a, it's a hardy crop. It, you know, wheat cannot grow under severe conditions. It withers up. You know, think of trials and tribulations, you know. Yeah. The wheat has trouble, but the barley can, can, can survive through that. It's... <laughs> <laughs> so the barley is a good symbol of the overcomer who will flourish in times of drought in between when the spirit of God does not appear to be moving you know sometimes God tests us and it's like where's where's God where's the Holy Spirit well barley can make it through that those times of testing even, even very long times yeah. <laughs> okay, we should be on page 15. Oh no, I'm sorry, it's 8. Yeah, you're right. Okay. More about God's calendar. As, as I mentioned earlier, e each day starts at sundown. The Sabbath starts on Friday evening when the sun goes down and ends on Saturday evening when the sun goes down. And we see this from the very beginning. This is the way God's calendar works. God, in Genesis 1, verses 3 through 5, says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And he called the light day, and the darkness he called light. But look at the order. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the evening is the first part, and the morning is the second part of each day. 
The Hebrew calendar is based on the lunar cycle, and by the way, uh, that got changed with um, the you know the, the Julian calendar was uh, Julius Caesar in with Rome. He made one change, and then after that, the Gregorian calendar refers to Pope Gregory, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's when the calendar was changed. Uh, and that's our calendar. That's right. We were on the Julian calendar. Mm. I'm sorry, the Gregorian calendar. Yeah. The, the, the Hebrew calendar is, uh, we already went over this, based on the lunar cycle where the new moon is always dark. And the full moon is always the 15th of the Jewish month. The lunar cycle lasts 29.52 days. In other words, I think, what is it? That means the moon, the moon goes around the earth every 29.52 days, right? Did I get that right? <laughs> now, I don't even know if that's true. I don't even, no, 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 because the, the... Well, anyway, the cycle from the, each new moon to the next new moon is 29.52 days. Um, so the way that they would determine whether the new moon could be seen in the sky is they would send out two, um, two witnesses... Uh, would go and, and see if they could see a sliver of the moon, and they would come. They would go out and look independently, and they would come back and testify before the Sanhedrin, mm -hmm. and then the Sanhedrin would say, "Okay, we're officially sanctifying the next month." Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because each month could last tw either 29 or 30 days, mm -hmm. and you're not sure until the, until you go and look and see the sliver of the new moon. Now we've we've calculated that all out now. You know, and we we can tell when when the sliver of the new moon will be seen. But back then, it was all manual observation. So, going back to the Feast of Trumpets, remember that's the only feast day that starts on the first day of a month when it's dark. And so, you know, w w when when the Jews are like get preparing for a feast day of the Lord, right? Which, you know, you've got specific things that you're required to do. It makes things a little difficult when you're trying to prepare and you're not sure which day <laughs> the festival is going to start, right? And so one of the nicknames for the Feast of Trumpets was the day that no man knows. So w when Jesus was talking about his second return and he started using terminology like no man knows the day, the Jewish mind is thinking, oh my goodness, he's returning on the Feast of Trumpets. So, that's another tidbit of information. I mean, the, the feast days are so beautiful when you start to understand them. It just opens up your mind to all kinds of stuff, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful thing. Uh, next, okay. Um, I already spoke about the two feast days that are on the 15th that have a full moon. Leap years. So, because each lunar cycle only lasts 29 and a half days, 12 months is approximately 354 days, and which is 11 days shor shorter than the solar cycle. So the way the Jews would do that is every three years or so, they actually add a second 12th month. They add a whole month? Yeah. Because 11 times 3 is, you know, a little more, more or less than 30, you know, so that's how they would, that's how they would do their leap year thing. Yeah. And it's actually not every three years. It's it's uh, seven times every 19 years that they do that. Uh, okay, so you can go to the... Oh, wait. Actually, go back if you don't mind. The way that they would determine, though, back then is because, you know, keep in mind that the feast days are all about the harvest. And so uh, the Feast of First Fruits, where you have to bring the first fruits of the barley harvest, you've got to have barley that's already ripened mm. in order to hold that feast. Otherwise, you can't, there's nothing you can bring yeah, yeah. You know, to the Lord. And the Lord says, don't come empty-handed. Mm -hmm. He's like, you got to bring something. Mm. And so this is the way they would determine whether they needed to add a month is the ripeness of the barley. Mm. So at the end of 12 months, you know, you can see in the picture there, they would like go out to the fields and say, okay, is the barley ripe enough so that when... When the Feast of Unleavened Bread comes, we're going to be ready and we're going to have something to bring. Mm -hmm. That's how they would, you know, and if not, they would add another month. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that, you know, every, every 19 years, it's going to happen about, it's going to happen seven times. Okay, thanks, Luke.
Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go over these in detail. We're, you know, we're probably a lot of us familiar with most of these things, but, you know, if you study in the New Testament and, and then look back to the Old Testament and see God's specific instructions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll just go over this first one in detail. In, in Exodus 12, 3, Verses 3, 5, and 6, here are the instructions God gives regarding the Passover. This is to the people in Exodus. Remember, they're in Egypt. And these are the original instructions God is giving. You know, the angel of death is coming, and if you follow these instructions, the angel of death will pass over your house, and your firstborn will not be killed. So he says, speak to everybody, saying, on the tenth of this month, Every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So this is the prophecy that Jesus is going to fulfill. Mm. Your lamb shall be without blemish, blemish, and now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, which is Passover. Okay, so God is saying, bring your lamb in four days before you kill it. And, the, and he says, the lamb shall be without blemish. And so the point is, they would actually bring it into their house. And the kids would play with the lamb, you know, for four days, get to know him. And, you know, if the lamb's got any blemish, if you're hanging around with it for four days, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to see it, right? So this is the inspection of the lamb. There's a four-day period, right? Well, Jesus fulfilled this to the jot and the tittle because he, when he came in on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem on the donkey, it was the 10th of Nisan, the very day when, in, during Israel, all of Israel was like finding their lamb and, 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 and selecting the lamb that was out without blemish. And Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to present himself as the lamb who is worthy to be slain. It's just... Sorry, I get a little worked up when I read this stuff. It's just so beautiful. And um, let's look at these verses. Matthew 26, this is after Jesus came in. Hosanna, Hosanna. Remember they laid their coats down? Matthew 26, 59 through 60. Now the chief priests, the elders, and the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. They're inspecting the lamb. They don't even realize it. They're fulfilling scripture, right? The chief priests, the elders, and the council. Even though many false witnesses came forward, it says they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward. So they inspected the lamb. They couldn't find anything, so they had to come up with lies. And then Luke 23, 13 through 15. Then Pilate, look at what Pilate says. When he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning the things that you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. So you see how this is it's, it's like every jot and tittle in the prophecy that was given to the to the to the children of Israel during the Exodus was, was fulfilled to the jot and the tittle. Okay, so we're going to go through the next ones, you know, just in the interest of time. Uh, this one talks about how the, the the specific instructions in Exodus say that he should be killed at twilight, and Jesus died in the ninth hour of the day at 3 p.m. And how twilight this is the, during twilight. The, the timing of his death fulfilled the original prophecy back in Exodus. Exodus 12, 7 says, Put the blood on the two doorposts at the side and on the top. That's the shape of a cross. Uh, Exodus 10, 12, 10 says, you got to eat all the lamb. None of it can remain until morning, and, and, and you got to burn it with fire. Jesus was taken down from the cross before the next morning. And uh, and then Exodus twelve forty six, you shall not break any of its bones when you eat the lamb. None of Jesus' bones. Okay, go to the next slide. Were broken when he was crucified. Um, unleavened bread. 
the instructions were, on the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. So this is the day of Passover on the 14th. For if anyone eats what is leaven from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. This is serious. That means death. Uh, this commemorates that the Jews left Egypt. Leaven always re represents sin in the Bible. Um, and so, it represents puffiness, arrogance, and pride. And, uh, you know, as, as you see there, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, talking about, you know, purging out the old leaven. Uh, and, and for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven. He's talking about the feast of Passover here. Let's keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Jesus fulfilled this uh, in accordance with 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For he made him who knew no sin, he was unleavened. He knew no sin. To be sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in him. And, and Jesus was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Next, Luke. Jesus cleansed the leaven from the temple, uh, Mark 11. They came, uh, Mark 11, verses 15 through 17. So they came to Jerusalem, then Jerusalem went to the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturn the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now this is after the triumphant entry on the 10th of Nisan. This is between the 10th of Nisan and his death that he went into the temple and drove the money changers out. And verse 16, He would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves? So this is the fulfill. This is again another fulfillment of the job in the temple. He went into the temple and cleaned house. He like took the. He's like, I'm getting rid of the leaven in my tabernacle. Uh, unleavened bread. You can see the picture there. It's striped because Jesus' body received many stripes, and it's pierced. The stripes are, are represent from the fire, the burning, the, and then the piercings. You know, his death on the cross. But one of the soldiers, John 19.34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. He was pierced for our transgressions and by his stripes we are healed. Next, Luke. Um, this is the, the sheaf of first fruits. You shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And again, remember we talked about the barley harvest. This is barley. So the concept here of first fruits is that you're going out to your field and you're reaping, you're harvesting the barley that has matured quickest. Right? So you've got this element of placing honor on, on those who are mature, are maturing quickly than the rest. Right? Right. And, 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 and you're taking that to the tabernacle and presenting it to God. Um, and a, a lot of people, you know, and we're not going to get into eschatology, but a lot of people believe that that's a representation that some some people will be taken away first because they're mature and they're ready. And, you know, they're going to be raptured out of here before, you know, the, the, the wheat. Um, so... First fruits reflects the requirement to put the Lord first in our lives, even before our own needs have been met. You see, the, the, the first pieces of barley that were harvested, they didn't use to make food and feed themselves with. They took it to the temple and presented it to the Lord. That's what first fruits is all about, is, is placing God before ourselves. Um, Jesus was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. His resurrection was the first fruits of the righteous, and we will follow him in resurrection. So he's the first fruits of the resurrection, as you see there in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. But now Christ has risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. 
For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So he's the first fruits. He gets resurrected first, and we follow him. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. So, just to summarize the, the you know the overview of the feast days. You know, go go to the next one. They're they're prophetic on multiple levels. There was a near term prophetic fulfillment. In other words, the Israelites followed God's instructions in Egypt, and there was a near term fulfillment. They didn't you know the firstborn of their house was not slaughtered by the angel of death. They have prophetic fulfillment in Jesus Christ. As we just read, he fulfilled them to the jot and the tittle. But they also have prophetic fulfillment for you and me, his adopted sons and daughters. You know, as we mentioned, Passover is, is, is our justification, but we, we've got to take up our cross and die to ourselves, just like Jesus did. We follow Jesus, and that results in it, it's a prophecy in our own lives. Jesus' blood redeems us from the wages of sin. Praise God. Unleavened bread, you know, it's, just, it's kind of part two of the justification process. We got to bury our old man, you know. We got to, we have to be vigilant to get rid of sin in our lives and become holy and set apart like Jesus. You know, faith without works is dead. If we say that we believe in Jesus, but we don't have works, mm-hmm. our faith is useless. It's it's not real faith. So uh, unleavened bread represents we we got to bury our old man, and the first fruits. That's a prophecy of the Holy Spirit resurrecting us just like the Holy Spirit resurrected Jesus. He resurrects us to new life. And when we walk in the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the flesh. So, uh, And then baptism is a picture of these first three feasts, right? Because, you know, your, your, your uh, baptism represents going under the ground and burying yourself and then coming up in the newness of life. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And then Pentecost is the enthronement of God in His temple, the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is just an amazing thing when you think about it, that God would make His temple inside of us. It's just, I mean, when you think about it, it's just so amazing that the Almighty God of the universe would choose to live inside of us. What a humbling thought. Uh you know, and, and, and this represents the law which was written on stone has now been written on our hearts. And this is the core of what the Feast of Pentecost is all about. The law is being written on our hearts. The Holy Spirit, through the, the, the you know, what we just talked about, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Well, how do we renew our minds? It's the Holy Spirit. He's written the law on our hearts. The Holy Spirit comes in. We're going to see that. We're, we're going to study that in detail and see that. So Pentecost, in Leviticus, uh, it says, You shall count for, for yourselves, Leviticus 23, 15 through 17, You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So this is talking about coming into the temple with your first fruits barley. Fifty days, and that was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Fifty days after that, seven Sabbaths, 49 days, and then the next day. Count fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of a nut path. That's a measure, form of measurement. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. So this is a second first fruits offering. The, the first fruits, the first first fruits offering <laughs> happened during that Passover week when you went in with your barley. This time, okay. You go into your wheat fields and you find which of the wheat has harvested first and you grab that and you make two loaves of bread and you put leaven in them. This time, 
And you present those loaves, you go to the tabernacle, and they're waved before the Lord, the two loaves of bread. And this is your first fruits offering to the Lord. And so, you know, the, the idea is, you know, some people say, well, that represents the Jews and the Gentiles, the two loaves. And, and um, Pentecost in Hebrew is called Shavuot, which is the Hebrew word for sevens. That's because uh, Shavuot is to be observed. After seven sevens, or seven weeks have passed, and on the next day, the 50th day after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The word Pentecost is based on the Greek word for 50, which is pente. So that's where we get the word Pentecost from, is from the 50 days. Next, Luke. The first fruits offering... At the Feast of Pentecost, um, I just mentioned that. Um, at Pentecost, they're required to offer a second first fruits offering, which I already covered. It's a picture of sinful man uh, represented by the leaven, giving the first fruits, the first and best part of his life, as an offering to the Lord. You know what I mean? And when I, when I think of this, I'm thinking of, you know, what's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's what this is talking That's what First Fruits is about. It's like giving Him your best. And I already mentioned Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, you're dying to yourself and, and giving. You mentioned this, Bruce, earlier. You know, we're still alive, and we're supposed to present ourselves to God as if we've died to ourselves. And God, you have all of me. Take all of me and use me however you want me to use the uh, however you want to use me. Uh, so we fulfill this feast when we obey those instructions, presenting ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Okay, now sw switching gears a little bit, this is the timing of the Feast of Pentecost and how um, Pentecost actually it was on the anniversary of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Jewish rabbis teach, so it's part of Jewish tradition, that, that uh, the law was given on the day of Pentecost. In other words, the Ten Commandments. Moses came down and presented the Ten Commandments on the day of Pentecost. In fact, one of the Hebrew nicknames for Pentecost is the season of the giving of the law. Christian commentaries teach the same thing. And so we're going to look at the timeline of the exodus out of Egypt and we'll see that it's, it's right at that 50-day period that they arrived at Mount Sinai. Exodus 13.4 and, and Leviticus 23.5 and 6 Say that, you know, tell us that Passover was on the 14th day of the first month, right before the Israelites left Egypt. So, um, one, in, in Exodus 16, 1, it says, one month later the Israelites entered the wilderness of sin on the 15th day of the second month. So we're talking 30 days after they left. And then, in Exodus 19.1, it says, In the third month, the same day, came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So, that that's referring to the first day of the third month, when it says, in the third month, the same day. In other words, the same day that the month started. So, this is the first day of the third month. So, that's going to be about a month and a half after the 14th or 15th day of the first month. You see that? 45 or 46 days after leaving Egypt. And then it, the scripture in Exodus 19 says that Moses went up the mountain, got instructions, came down to the, came down again, and then went up again, got more instructions, and came down again and said, okay, God has told me that you need to get ready and come to the foot of Mount Sinai in three days. So if you add, you know, uh, four or five days to that 45 or 46 days, you come to 50, Right? So you can see that the biblical record supports what the rabbis and the Christian commentaries teach, that, that uh, Pentecost is the anniversary of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And we're going to see some more evidence on the next slide, Luke. 
The New Covenant, both the Old Testament and the New Testament reflect that the New Covenant was fulfilled by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And, and it was for fulfillment of the giving of the law. You can see there Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That's a reference, a direct reference to the feast days of the Lord. Because, you know, when I, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So the purpose of the new covenant is because the old covenant broke was broken, and he's going to fix that. And here's how he's going to fix it. But this is the, is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, when he came into us, He's fulfilling the giving of the law. And there's a whole bunch of ramifications that come along with that. You know? Because if you go back to the Old Testament and see the emphasis in the Torah that's placed on the law, I mean, very specific instructions. You know, don't sit on this bench during certain, you know, you know I mean, just... I mean, stuff that you look at and you go, you got to be kidding me, God cares about this stuff? Minute detail in the law of the Old Testament. And you remember, that's all a shadow of, of, of the truth, right? And so all of those minute details that you see surrounding the giving of the law apply to the Holy Spirit and His role in our lives. And so what that tells you is the Holy Spirit is very concerned and wants to give you instructions about minute details in your life that you might think are like, well, this just seems absurd almost sometimes, right? But no, God, you know, this is the shadow. The shadow, when you, when you go through the Old Testament and you read about the law, you're going to have a mindset now, oh my goodness, this is a shadow of, of, of the purpose of the Holy Spirit in my life. And how he wants to guide me and lead me, and you know the other thing is there are there are serious ramifications in the Old Testament towards disobeying the law, right? Sometimes the result was death, and so when when you look at that shadow and then transfer it to the Holy Spirit's role in our lives, these are the things that we've been talking about as a group for the last several months, right? Is it, we, we've got to we've got to take holiness and sanctification serious, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And and the and, and the Holy Spirit is our helper to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just such a beautiful picture. Yes. And in Hebrews eight ten through twelve, this is the in the New Testament it says the same thing. Mm -hmm. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So, you know, like the Passover lamb we must die to ourselves and do the will of the Father. Pentecost represents the enthronement of God in His temple, our bodies. He comes as King to rule and reign over our lives. The Shekinah glory that dwelt in the tabernacle in the Old Testament now lives in our bodies. The Shekinah glory, you remember, if people entered into the Shekinah glory without proper preparation, they were struck dead. That represents the Holy Spirit living in our, our, in our lives. You know, I mean, there's a bunch of ramifications there, too, about keeping our tabernacle clean and holy. The curtain has been torn, and now each of us can enter into his presence and hear his voice. We can have, this is the intimacy 
you know, entering into his presence and, and just praying. I mean, the, the, the picture of the tabernacle and the altar of incense about prayer, you know, stopping at the table of showbread where we, we, we delve into his word and the Holy Spirit is there lighting the way, that the, 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 uh, the, the candle, the candlestick, the Holy Spirit just lights our way and leads us and guides us around through the holy place. He's our guide and, you know, w- without the light, we wouldn't know what to do. The law which was written on stone has now been written in our hearts. Our responsibility is is to obey the law now represented by the Holy Spirit that is written in our hearts. Now, remember, the the law has not been abolished. So it's not like we we ignore the Bible, the, the written word of God. But this is, in addition to that, it's a fulfillment, you know, and the Holy Spirit has come along to help us. And so, when the Holy Spirit says something to us, that, in my mind, what this is teaching, is that that's the equivalent of seeing something in the Bible and having to obey the Bible. If you hear the Holy Spirit tell you to do something, yeah. it carries the same authority as Scripture. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. And, and, you know, and, and I think, at least in my life, I haven't appreciated, you know, a lot of times I, I, I just don't stop and think. You know, the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God of the universe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we worship the Holy Spirit just like we worship God the Father and Jesus. Yeah. We are to worship the Holy Spirit and hold Him in, 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 in His rightful place as God. The Holy Spirit is God. So, Jesus set the example. And Jesus had the same tools that we did. He had the Holy Spirit. He was a man just like us, but he used the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and look, at, look at what Jesus says. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. He went a little farther and f- he went a little farther, meaning Jesus, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cut pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, a second time he went away, prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Then in John 5:19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but whatever he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Remember what we just were talking about, how the, sh- the shadow of the law in the Old Testament and the minute detail and how the Holy Spirit is, is, is what casts that shadow in the Old Testament. And, and, and so that's how we should treat the Holy Spirit. And, and look at this verse. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. Is I, I don't do anything unless the Holy Spirit tells me what to do. In other words, the Father is telling me what to do through the Holy Spirit, right? Amen. Amen. John 5.30, I can, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the, the will of the Father who sent me. John 14.10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? That's via the Holy Spirit. The vehicle for that to happen is the Holy Spirit. Yes. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So we we cannot follow Jesus unless we walk in the Spirit, right? And obey Him in minute detail. And and you know before you can obey, you've got to hear what He's telling you to do first, right? <laughs> Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Not every listen to this Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three. This verse scares me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who who is in heaven. Stop there because... Well, no, let's go on. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, does the word lawlessness open your, your eyes a little now that you understand? That the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of the giving of the law? Right? 
So these people are serving God, but they're not walking in the Spirit. They're doing it in the flesh. And look what Jesus tells them. Get away from me. Depart from me. You're a worker of lawlessness. It's because they're not hearing what the Holy Spirit tells them to do and doing it. They're, they're coming up with their own plan. This is the religious spirit. Right? Mm -hmm. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. This is Paul talking to the Philippians. But now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And here's the reason why. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And you know, this is he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us do God's will, right? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this without the Holy Spirit. And the word do is 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 that word that we use uh, for dynamite. The Hebrew word is dynamus or something like that. So the Holy Spirit gives us the power to to fulfill to to uh, to obey the whole, to uh, do the will of the Father, which is really just obeying the law. To do anything other other than that is lawlessness. Okay. We have been chosen to hear the Holy Spirit's voice and do the will of God. This is such a beautiful thing. The the grace of God. Look at what what. Paul said, this is in Acts 22, 14. Paul is in front of the mob in Jerusalem just before he gets sent off to Rome. And he's telling them his testimony. And he says, this is Paul. Then he said, the God... Paul's talking about Ananias. You remember when the bright light blinded him? And Ananias came to him. And this is what Ananias told Paul. The God of our fathers has chosen you, Paul, that you should know his will and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. We, the Holy Spirit shows, it, it helps us know what the will of the Father is, see Jesus, and hear the voice of his mouth. Jesus himself in John 10, 27 said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is the law. This is the law that we have to obey, and follow is the voice of the Holy Spirit. John 10 most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. So they follow him, he goes before them, he leads them. The sheep hear his voice. Go ahead, Luke. The beautiful thing is that we don't have to do this in our own strength. That's the beauty of the new covenant is that God recognized we, we can't do this. That's what the old covenant taught us. And we need the Holy Spirit. Luke twenty four forty nine. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And John 14, he said, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. He'll never leave us or forsake us. John 14, 26, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. That's the last slide, right, Luke? No. I think it is. No, there's one more. No, that's it. So, today, you know, I, I was thinking about this this morning, you know, it, it's, and I thought, you know, today's the birthday of the Holy Spirit, and we're celebrating the birthday of the Holy Spirit. But it's really not the birthday of the Holy Spirit because, of course, the Holy Spirit is eternal and He's been around forever. He has no beginning and no end. But, so, the the truth is that it is a birthday and it's the birthday of the church. It's the birthday of the new covenant. 
and, and it's the birthday of the renewal of the law given on Mount Sinai so that we have the ability to live in a way that pleases God. You know, and, and this goes against the whole teaching of the hyper grace movement. You know, that all you got to do is accept Jesus and that's all there is to it. And you, you can live your own life how you want to. No, 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 no. The shadow, you know, the Old Covenant is a shadow of the New. And if you look into the Old Covenant and you understand the roots of the Feast of Pentecost, yes. we're required to strictly obey God. Yes. Yes. And yes. praise God that he, 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 it's so ironic that he tells us, I, you have to strictly obey me. And then he says, here's the good news is I'm the one who's going to give you the power and the ability <laughs> to do that. It's such a beautiful thing. Father God, we just praise you. We praise you, Father, for this plan that we can see in writing, Father, that you had this plan all along, way back. You know, when the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt, Father, you planned all this out. You knew that you were going to give your Holy Spirit, but first you decided, you know what? I'm going to give them a covenant that they cannot meet to emphasize the fact that I'm the one. I am I am God Almighty. And I am the only one that can do what needs to be done. And you need to place all of your reliance on me. And so, Father, we confess our reliance on you, Father, just like the testimonies that we heard, Father, before we, before we, before we started... Hearing your teaching today, Father, the testimonies that that we we heard around this room was the faithfulness of God and and the need to remind ourselves, Father, that we can't do we can't do these things without you, Father. And that's what Pentecost is all about, Father. We just praise your Holy Spirit, Father. May we keep in mind, Father, that the Holy Spirit is God Almighty, God Eternal the God that exists out of time, space, and matter. Father, that created all of that. And and that God, that almighty, amazing God that's beyond our comprehension has chosen to live in our bodies as His temple, Father. Father, we just, we need Your Holy Spirit power, Father. Father, may, may You bless us, Father. May You anoint us. May You Anoint our ears to hear Your Word through Your Holy Spirit, Father. And when You speak Your Word, Father, may we may we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. May you, may Your Word in our ear and written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. May we always have a fear, a holy fear, of the Holy Spirit, Father. May we not tarry after the Holy Spirit talks, Father. The tearing was the wait for the power of the Father. There's no need to tarry now, Father. We need to act promptly when your Holy Spirit tells us, this is what I want you to do, Father. And I confess my sin, Father, in my life, Father, that I have not done that, Father. And oh, Father, we just praise you. We worship you. We thank you. Thank you for the new covenant that gives us what we need to live in a way that pleases you. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name.